first reading this morning comes from the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, fifth through the eighth verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh, and a refreshment for your body. Our second reading comes from the book of Judges, chapter 16 and 23rd to the 31st verse. Now the Lord of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to the great their God Dagon, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has given Samson our enemy into our hand. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, and let him entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. They made him stand between the pillars, and Samson to the attendant who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which this house rests, so that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Lord God, remember me and strengthen me only this once. O oh God, so that with this one act of revenge, I may pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped, grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. He strained with all his might, and the house fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So those he killed at his death were more than those he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and his, all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtabal in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel twenty years. The epistle reading this morning is comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with him into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so the grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, what cannot be seen is eternal. This story is often skipped over as 
well as many other stories in Judges because they offer up gruesome details. As such, for much of the past, the book of Judges has had sort of a bad reputation. It's only used in the lectionary, only a few verses. So clearly, we try to avoid it at all costs. Children's Bibles, they skip over just about everything in the book of Judges except this little snippet of Samson's story. It's got a bad reputation because people usually say, this is the book that I don't want to study. When they talk about not wanting to study the Old Testament, they're usually referring to this book or the book of Joshua. Because it is in these books that we reveal this God who is vengeful and wrathful. But we believe and live into the book of order that we are guided by. It says that scriptures bear witness to the word of God which was revealed fully in Jesus' life. We believe this, and we must believe that even these hard-hitting scriptures have something that God is trying to reveal to us. Now I'm giving you a warning. Today's topic is a little bit tough, and I debated whether to even preach on it. But I know that God wants us to face those tough situations and give us acknowledge and, and wisdom to deal with that. So in this short portion of Samson's story, we see a mass murder of innocent people, and subsequently, death by suicide. If you didn't know it was from the Bible, you may have thought it was the headline news. Since the 1999 Columbine shooting, there have been 10 mass school shootings, killing over 122 innocent people. Suicide is now the second most leading cause of death for teens. It beats out homicide. The statistics reveal that in 2016, 13,525 teens died by suicide. And as the statistics roll in for 2017, the numbers show a rapid increasing pace of more Samson's story can offer us insight into the understanding of why these terrible tragedies happen. Now, Samson's story doesn't begin in the part that we are given. It begins back in chapter 13. With the recognition of his miracle birth to a barren mother. She has an angel come to her who informs her that Samson would be designated as a Nazarite. Now, we learn from Numbers, from the book of Numbers, what it means to be a Nazarite. A Nazarite is someone who takes a temporary vow to separate themselves from, to the Lord. They separate themselves by following strict requirements, which meant refraining from any wine or strong drink, from any grape or any grape product, from razors to cut their hair, or from dead bodies, even if it meant missing their own family's funeral. However, in Judges, it reveals that Samson was designated as a Nazarite from birth until death. This means Samson was not only never given the choice to be a Nazarite, but he is forced to serve it until the day he dies. He is forced to live a life which included these strict requirements his entire life without any choice of his own. I had to wonder what kind of effect this would have had on his psyche. As I pondered this aspect of Samson's story, 
think of the parents who choose a life path for their child before they're even born, expecting them to maybe live into the family business, to you know, take over the family business. Or the parents who choose to push their child into activities, to vicariously live their own out their own endless desires, who choose their lives, children's lives paths, instead of giving them the autonomy to choose their own life's path. We aren't given much about Samson's childhood, but his life story does pick up in chapter 14. It is where he demands his parents to obtain a wife for him from the Philistines. The Philistines. They were ones who were harshly oppressing the Israelites and his family and himself his whole life. Why would he want a wife from the Philistines? Well, given his designated Nazarene status from birth to death, is it any wonder that he should be rebelling against this vow and acts like a spoiled child? It's like the child who begins acting against the life path chosen for them by their parents after several years of commitment to it. Samson's story, though, really begins to build. As the first evidence of violence is revealed in the report of what occurred on that journey to meet his first Philistine wife. Along that way, he encounters a lion which the scriptures say he tore apart bare-handedly. The author of this scripture makes an interesting and I believe telling point that is often passed over. Samson kept this act of violence a secret from his parents. This act of violence which Samson chooses to keep from his parents may have been a warning sign future violent end. <clears throat> Sue Clevel, mother of Dylan, a Columbine shooter, in a 2020 interview explained that as she combed through her life trying to figure out where she went wrong, she realized that she missed some warning signs. That she chalked them up to just an adolescent phase. It's easy for us to miss warning signs, to chalk them up to something else. This first violent action by Samson and his desire to hide it reveals warning signs of troubled mental stability and poor coping mechanisms. He struggled to deal with life's happenings. Samson's story, though, goes on. With many acts of betrayal and his increasing violence due to his desire for revenge against the Philistines. The final story of betrayal in Samson's narrative reveals Samson's true self. It's the story of Delilah. The true Samson who lacked positive coping mechanisms, who struggled every day to trust in God, who only during desperation acknowledges his strength is from God, and who reacts with increasing violence motivated by revenge for all the hurt done to him by others. This final ch chapter that ends with mass murder and death by suicide reveals his mental instability and the final struggle that would put him over the edge. Samson was worn down by Delilah's nagging, possibly threatened by rape, sleep deprived, and then in a moment of intimacy, betrayed by the woman he loved. The result would be the Philistines capturing him and gouging out his eyes, then forcing him to grueling labor 
for the rest of his life. Is it any wonder that he would desire suicide over a life of grueling punishment that would lead to, likely to a painful death? Or that he would have so much hatred after a lifetime of cruelty from the Philistines that his anger would reach its breaking point in this extreme act of violence? Psychologists who study modern day mass school shooters offer some warning signs. One of those signs is fixation behaviors. Samson became fixated on seeking revenge against the Philistines. Another sign is progressive increase in violence that may or may not be related to any targeted group. Samson also displayed this warning sign in his increasing violence throughout his whole life. But one of the most major warning signs of someone with suicidal thoughts is hopelessness. Samson experienced hopelessness. Samson is the last judge in the book of Judges. And his story displays the deterioration of the Israelites' trust in God and commitment to the covenant. Samson is the example of those who suffer from mental instability and depression. He examples those in our society who need desperately to have someone near them who will actively listen to them without judgment. According to Jean Twenge, in her book about today's teen generation, these iGen teens, as she refers to them, realize that they need more face-to-face -face interaction. And they desire it. <coughs> but they lack the ability to find places and friends that they feel are safe to have these discussions. So how the story of Samson's and its parallels to what is going on with this I Gen teen generation mean anything to Christians or to the church or to even this church. Samson's story reminds us that everyone, even those viewed as superior or privileged or who seemingly have significant opportunities, are susceptible to hopelessness and despair. This hopelessness and despair that many struggle with often leads to negative outcomes and even suicide. Judges reminds us that God wanted the Israelites and Samson to trust and put their hope in God because in doing so, they would find their meaning for life. It is from this point that God calls all Christians to follow what God tried to teach the Israelites and why Jesus came with a message of love and a command to put our hope in the Lord. As Christians, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, which was read this morning, that we look not to what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. <coughs> what can be seen is temporary. What cannot be seen is eternal. We have hope for what is eternal. A hope that we are called to share with others. This may seem like a difficult task. It's often used by the word evangelism. Sort of a dirty word for Presbyterians. But God is calling us to share that hope with others. When we recognize the signs of emotional struggle in a friend, a teen, or anyone, ask them to share about their life with you. Out of honest Christian love, actively listen to them. This means setting aside all prejudgments, intently concentrating trying to truly experience the pain alongside with them. <laughs> if they ask you about your story or about your love, don't 
shy away from sharing that hope you have in God's eternal plan. We as Christians accept this task. Are we really willing to sit with others and endure their pain with them, just like Jesus endured pain for our sake? Are we willing to go and spread the gospel of Jesus, sharing the love and hope in things unseen? These are definitely difficult tasks, even for myself. <coughs> But as God desired of the Israelites, and as God desires of all Christians, put your trust in God to overcome 